when we sing that song, it reminds me of, I believe it's in Isaiah chapter 6, where it talks about the angels that are called seraphim that minister in the presence of God. And they say, the Bible says over and over and over again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to be looking at several verses. I think it's only like seven or eight verses over the next three weeks. We're going to be starting a three-week sermon series on three different messages. Three what I think are very important messages in the book of Revelation. They come in Revelation chapter 14. So if over the next week or so you want to do a little extra reading, um, feel free to, to read through this chapter as well as maybe some other books that, that talk about this. Um, these, these verses, I think, are huge. I don't think they're there on accident. You see, in the book of Revelation, Revelation is a special book. I believe it's the only book where it's repeated over and over again, the message. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Over and over. So how many of us have ears? We all do. That means this message is for you. And so as we go through this, I want you to be thinking about how you fit in to this message. How does this message affect your life, your walk with Jesus? There are three angels with three messages. And I will say this right now, that these messages are pretty intense. The next two weeks specifically will be very intense. There are deep things that God wants to reveal to us through Scripture. There was a young man named Howard, and Howard had the good fortune of living close to the Amherst family mansion just outside of Swaffham, England. And Howard would go over to their house because they had something there that caught his attention that he was very, very interested in. This is back around the turn of the century, 1900s, 1800s to 1900s. I guess I have to clarify that now since we turned another century in the last 20 years. The century before that. Howard would go over to this mansion because they had in their house a fantastic collection of Egyptian artifacts. You see, back then, you could go to Egypt and see the pyramids. It would take you a while to get there. But once you got there, the the things, the souvenirs that you could bring home back then were very different than the souvenirs that you can bring back home today. If you go to the Science Museum here in Denver and you go see the Egyptian artifacts and they even have some of these sarcophaguses there, the reason that we have those here in Denver is because somebody, just like young Howard, went back to Egypt and bought those things as souvenirs and brought them back here to the United States. And so, in the same way, the Amherst family had gone to Egypt and brought back a whole bunch of Egyptian artifacts to display in their home. If you've ever been to the the Hearst Castle, anybody been to the Hearst Castle in California? Beautiful, beautiful place. William Randolph Hearst, outside of where his beautiful outdoor pool is, he has an Egyptian statue an original Egyptian statue that someone went over and bought and he paid for and and put it at his house. And this thing is thousands of years old. It was in Egypt decorating some palace somewhere. Now he has it there. So back then, you could go and you could get all kinds of stuff from Egypt and just bring it home as a souvenir, priceless stuff. And so young Howard would go over to the Amherst family mansion there and would look at all of their stuff with fascination. As Howard got older, he studied more about Egyptology. And when he was about 17 years old, Howard, whose last name is Carter, got a chance to go to Egypt and to work in some of the digs that they had, pulling up a bunch of these priceless artifacts, searching for the tombs of the pharaohs. And although he was only 17 when he went there, Carter was innovative in improving the methods of copying tomb decoration. He was involved in recording wall release for the Temple of Hatshepsut, the only female pharaoh. He was involved in a lot of very high-profile searching in Egypt for some of these hidden tombs. Carter was praised for his improvements of the protection and accessibility 
of the existing excavation sites and his development of a grid block system for searching for tombs. He made it his life goal to find more of these Egyptian tombs to see what was in there and what they could learn about the Egyptian civilization. He would develop new ways to find things and say, well, because of this pattern, I'm guessing that there's something over here somewhere or over here somewhere. And he studied it and he put a lot of work into it and he learned and studied and learned and studied so that he could find these priceless treasures that were buried under the sands in Egypt. Eventually, the Antiquities Service provided funding for Carter to head his own excavation projects. He was the guy in charge now, leading some of these excavations, finding these priceless artifacts. 1914, a man named Lord Carnarvon received a concession to dig in the Valley of the Kings, is what it was called, because they'd found so many different places where kings' pharaohs had been buried. And Carter was employed to work and to lead out these excavations. Unfortunately, World War I happened. He had to put it on pause. But back in 1917, he got back to work. And for five years, he worked for Lord Carnarvon. But he didn't find a whole lot during those five years. And he was told that he had one more season of funding to make a significant find in the Valley of the Kings. We haven't found anything significant. You have one more year to find something big, he was told. So Carter returned to the Valley of the Kings. He investigated a line of huts that he'd abandoned a few years earlier where he'd been digging underneath there. And the crew was clearing the huts and the rock debris underneath. And they weren't finding anything. But on November 4, 1922, one of the boys who was a water boy in charge of bringing water to all of the guys who knew how to do the really good work, tripped on a stone. And this stone, they started to look and they said, this doesn't fit here. And they started looking around the stone and they started digging around the stone and it ended up being a step. It ended up being the top step in a stairway that went down into the ground. And they started digging down. They, uh, they pulled all the dirt out and here's this stairway that goes down to a sealed door that has royal stamps on the door. So Howard Carter called back up, or he sent a telegram to Lord Carnarvon and said, hey, you need to come down here. It took him two and a half weeks to get there. They refilled it all in so nobody would mess with it. Until he got back there, they redug the steps and they wanted to see what was inside. On November 26, 1922, Carter made what they called a tiny breach in the top left-hand corner of the doorway. He was using a chisel that his grandmother had given him, <clears throat> him when he was 17 years old. And he chiseled away a little breach in the top left-hand corner of the doorway. Lord Carnarvon and his daughter were all there in attendance. And he was able to peer and look inside what was being hidden behind this door by candlelight. He was the only one that could see. And as he held the candle inside this little hole, he peeked in and Lord Carnarvon said, what do you see? Do you see anything? What do you see? And his fam he famously said, can you see anything? He said, yes, wonderful things, wonderful things. And they pried open and they found what would later be known as one of the best discoveries in all of Egypt, King Tut's tomb. He found one of the biggest treasure troves in all of Egypt. You see, he wouldn't have been able to find this unless he'd become very familiar with the Egyptian language, unless he had studied archaeology, unless he'd studied about the Valley of the Kings, unless he'd done research on finding where everything was and being able to guess, well, this shows a pattern and I can be here. He studied and learned way before he found any treasure. I would suggest to you today that when it comes to the book of Daniel and Revelation, that we have to study to find out where the treasure is in these books. But there is most definitely treasure to be found 
in the prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Some people get very intimidated by these books and say, whoa, there is just too much in here. I can't figure this out. But God would not have put it here unless he would have given us ways to figure out what he's trying to say. I asked somebody one time, I said, why is this all in so much, so, so ambiguous? Why are there so many different things that represent things? There's dragons and bears and all this other things and it represents this and there's people on horses. Why does, why does God use these different confusing images to tell us the most important message in the Bible? And someone said to me, they said, well, he did it to protect the messages. Because if it had been just clear out there, the devil would have messed with it somehow. But God preserved those messages by using these different illustrations so that we can look at it and figure it out for ourselves and we will have clarity of what God is trying to tell us in the Bible. God gives us incredible messages in the book of Revelation. Don't ever be intimidated by this book. You may have read through there and stopped and said, I'm done with this. <laughs> this is for people who study the Bible way more than I do. The book of Revelation is for every single one of us sitting in this room. There are messages that God has for his people, you, tucked away in this book. Let's turn to this book and go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, about two-thirds of the way through the book. And we are going to look at the messages of these three angels. Today we're going to look at the message of the first angel. And I think these messages contain messages that affect our lives and our eternal lives. Without a doubt. God wanted us to have this information because it is so valuable. Can you imagine back in the Garden of Eden? Can you imagine God taking Adam and Eve around the garden and just not telling them about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life? And just saying, hey, here's your new garden, here's your home, and just totally leave that out. No, because it meant so much. It meant literally life and death. And so in the same way when it comes to our salvation, in the time right before Jesus comes, Jesus makes sure to give us all the information that we need because he loves each and every one of us. He wants you to be prepared. So he gives us, just like he did Adam and Eve, all of the information that we need in order to be saved. Revelation chapter 14, let's read through it quickly. Uh, there's just a couple verses here. Verse six, Revelation chapter 14, verse six. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a quiet voice. Is that what it says? What does it say? Saying with a loud voice. That means it's for everyone to hear. It's not a secret. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And there you have it is the first message of the three angels. Just two short verses. Two short verses. So what is so important about this first message? Here's something I want to challenge you with before we get into this first message, and this goes for all three of these angels' messages. We have two choices when we look at these messages. Two choices. The first choice to not apply it to ignore it and say, well, that's, that's great, but I, I lead a busy life. I can't incorporate. I don't have time to even think about all this stuff. The second is to soak it in, to figure it out, to apply it to our lives. That is one of the most key things when we read the Bible. If we don't apply what we read to our lives, we are wasting our time, friends. If you read it and say, hey, that was a great verse for somebody else. <laughs> You've just wasted precious time in your life. The whole point of reading the scriptures is to apply something that we read to our lives to grow closer to Jesus. So what do we do with this? Let's look and dissect this piece by piece so that we can figure out what God is saying to us. What is God saying to you in this message? So first of all, it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, heaven having the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? Friends, this is one of the most beautiful things in all the world. 
The everlasting gospel includes a package of things that means the world to us. It means our salvation. It means Jesus' sacrifice on the cross so that we can be in heaven. It's a message of God's love. This is one of the biggest parts of the first angel's message. A message of God's love, the everlasting gospel. A part of God's love is forgiveness of sins. And praise the Lord for that. Part of that is the power to overcome the temptation. That's part of it. Part of the everlasting gospel is the promise of a future with no more evil. A future in a better place where there's no more heartache and sadness. I like to stay, I, I, I think I confessed to you a few weeks ago that I'm trying to ease back on the amount of news that I read. It's heartbreaking. After reading what's going on in this world, I have to go pick myself up somehow. Cheer myself up somehow. But part of this message, the everlasting gospel, is the hope in a better place. The hope in a place where there's no more sin, no more sadness, no more abuse, no more neglect, no more being let down. Excuse me, being let down. A promise in a better place. So the first angel's message starts off great. The first angel has the everlasting gospel to preach. To preach to who? It says, to everyone on earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So who is this message to go to? What is this end time message? This end time message is to share all of those things, the love that you feel from Jesus, the hope that you have in Jesus, the forgiveness that you've had in Jesus, the change that Jesus has brought in your life. That package is to be spread around the world so everyone can have the same hope that you and I have to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. When you travel around the world, it's amazing to see how God is working around the world. It's amazing to see how on Sabbath mornings, people are getting together, dressed differently, speaking differently, worshiping differently, but worshiping the same God, following the same instructions in the Bible as you and I do on this Sabbath morning today. God is doing work all over this world to prepare people to meet him. And he's using people just like you to do it. And if you're wondering how you can be a part of sharing that gospel, come talk to me afterwards. We'll brainstorm. We'll figure a way out. There are ways for you to impact God's work that you have no idea of right now. You might think, well, I just live here in Castle Rock or Franktown or, or Highlands Ranch or Parker. What can I do? We think small, but God thinks big. We think small, but God thinks big. God can use every single one of us here to help spread that message. And the, the Bible says, Matthew 24, verse 14, it says the, the message of the gospel will go to the whole world and then the end will come. So we have work to do as followers of Jesus. This has to happen before Jesus comes back. That gospel has to go to everyone in this world so that everyone has the same chance that you and I have to experience the love and the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ in our lives. But it keeps on going. Verse 7, it says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Now let's pause here for just a moment. It's easy to get hung up on this word fear. Fear. It's very easy to get hung up on this word fear because fear in our context today in 2018 in Franktown, Colorado has a very negative connotation. We fear being robbed at night, so we lock our door, right? I was driving down 25 and someone swerved right into me and immediately I feared I was going to be hit and it was a bad thing. If you're in the wrong part of a neighborhood, a tough neighborhood, you might fear getting jumped and robbed. Fear tends to be a negative thing. And so when it says fear God, I think a lot of us, even maybe not on purpose, make that connection with the old school style of religion of where we are supposed to worship God out of fear. That if you don't do this, if you don't go to church, you're going to be in trouble. Which is worshiping God for the wrong reason, right? Right? So what about this fear God? It's, it's, it's over and over and over in the Bible. Fear God, fear God, fear God. What is this? Let's look a little bit at some of these other verses that might help us understand what it means to fear God truly. 
I think as I read through these things that fear, and we'll put these four words in your mind just so you can be thinking about them as we read through this. I believe that fear refers to respect, reverence, love, and obedience. Keep those four words in your mind as we go through Respect, reverence, love, and obedience. Solomon, the wisest person in the Bible, said this, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 3, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? It says that fear, fearing God, is man's all. The most important thing. Okay, so what must this mean? Let's go on to Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Psalm 33, verse 18. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and he delivers them. Psalm 34, 9. There is no want of those who fear him. That makes me want to fear God. In whatever context he wants that to mean because it says there is no want for those who fear him. That means he's taking care of you. Psalm 85, 9. His salvation is near to those who fear him. Psalm 103, 11. Great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Psalm 115, 13. He will bless those who fear him. Psalm 145, 19. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him. Ecclesiastes 8, 12. It will go better with those who fear him. Do you see a trend here of positivity? Malachi 3.16, a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear his name. Malachi 4.12, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise. And I could go on and on and on. I see this as a positive thing. And the fear of the Lord, again, I believe is respect and honoring God. Realizing and acknowledging who God is and who you aren't reverence for God, love for God, and obedience to God. Obedience is not the most favorite word of anybody because that means we're doing someone else's will instead of our own. But when it comes to God, he knows more than we do. And part of this fear of the Lord that the Bible talks about, I believe, is following God's instructions and obeying what God has in mind for us and what he teaches us to do. Okay, so let's continue on. Verse seven, it says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. How do we give glory to God? What does that mean to give glory to God? I believe that it's God calling us not only to worship him, but to live a life that honors him. So that when people see us, somehow God is honored through that. Our reflection is of Jesus. And so we honor God by being his reflection and pointing people to him. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And when people see you doing that, they will see that you have been with God. And that will make an impression on them that will point them as well to God. Now, let's keep on going. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Okay, now this is a word that makes a lot of us uncomfortable. Judgment. Especially today. Don't ju you can't judge me. Don't judge me. You haven't walked in my footsteps. You can't judge me. Don't judge. We've heard that a thousand times. Don't judge anybody else. You're not the judge. And so the word judge or judgment has come across as a sort of a negative thing where we don't want to judge or judging anything is negative. But the Bible consistently teaches accountability, responsibility, and judgment. And this isn't a foreign concept for us. When we break the rules in life, there are consequences, right? I did a wedding uh, back in December, and the groom was running late to practice. And the groom was speeding a little bit. And the officer pulled him over. Natural. Everybody, anybody else had that experience? We've all been pulled over by a police officer because we broke the law. I remember my first ticket. I was 17 years old. It was burned into my memory. 
And this cop came out with a flat top buzz and he had a big mole on the side of his head. I remember that because I looked and I was like, wow, it's a big mole. And it's been burned into my mind forever. I got it because I was speeding doing 20 over. There are, there are consequences when we make bad decisions. This isn't a foreign thing for us. When we make mistakes, if someone gets, is robbing a house, A, there's two options. They're going to get shot or they're going to go to jail if they get caught. This idea of making a mistake and having consequences is not foreign to us. So the idea of being judged shouldn't be too far off. I mean, hopefully none of you have had to stand before a judge. If you've had that many tickets, then you need to slow down. Side story, my dad got his license taken away from him one time, and my mom had to drive him all over for business. We never let him forget that one. He got so many tickets in a row, they're like, he had to go before the judge, and the judge is like, we're taking away your driver's license. <laughs> if you've gone that far, you've got to slow down, but it shouldn't be a surprise, right? It shouldn't be a surprise. Let's look at the same verse we looked at earlier by Solomon. Fear God and keep his commandments, but it continues and says, for God will bring every deed into what? Judgment. Now, judgment is no surprise in the Bible. But there's an important point I want to bring to your attention when it talks about this. It says, judgment at this time is in the future. For God will bring every deed into judgment. At the time of this writer, the judgment was in the future, right? True or false? True. Contrast that with this in Revelation chapter 14 where it says, the hour of judgment has what? Come or is taking place right now. And this happens right before Jesus comes. See, the prophecies in the book of Daniel that reveal, if you go through, and, and maybe we'll have to have a sermon on this sometime in a Bible study in this, you see that when the time takes place, the judgment, when we read in the Bible, the end time judgment begins around 1844. And so this totally makes sense because at the time Solomon is writing this, the judgment hasn't started yet. He says, the judgment is coming. Here, in this time in Revelation, it says, Jesus is about to come, and right before Jesus comes, the judgment is already happening. So the timing here is good to note because it reiterates the things that the Bible teaches in other places as well. By the time Jesus returns, he will have completed this phase of judgment that involves investigation. And then he will come. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says, At that time, your people shall be delivered. And amen for that, huh? Your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Now, I've said this before, and I say it again just to reiterate it. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've given your life to him, you've asked forgiveness for your sins, you've made him your best friend, you've submitted your life to him, you have no worries in the judgment. You have nothing to worry about in the judgment because God is on your side. Because Jesus stands up for you in that judgment. And you, as a follower of Jesus, have no reason to be worried at all. He has your back in the judgment. The last part. It says, And worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. The end of this first angel's message involves worship, who we worship. Now, why would the angel specify who we have to worship and even give sort of a, a CV of, of who it is, the God? These are the markers of the God that you need to be worshiping. Why would God do that unless there were other entities that were vying for worship? The angel has to clarify, worship the one who is the creator God who made everything, which, by the way, this biblically verifies the creation story. If you hear people say, well, maybe God made it over a long period of time, he just started it and let it go, or even dabble with the idea of mixing evolution with God, here you can see that there is no question biblically how we got here. Only a creator God, because it says, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The angel even gets detailed. Worship the creator God. 
He is worship right before Jesus comes back. Again, these messages are for the time right before Jesus comes back. And let me, let me, um, let's go to verse 14 to 16 so we can verify this. Verse 14 to 16, again, these messages, this is the timing of them. It says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the white on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What's a, sh- a sickle used for? Harvest, right? Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the throne, Thrust your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, sat, so he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle onto the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is... This is a, imagery of Jesus coming for the second time. Jesus even verifies this. If you look back in Matthew chapter 13, verse 39, Jesus says, the harvest is the end of the age. He breaks it down for us. He says, when the Bible talks about a harvest, that means that's when I'm coming. That's the end of time on earth. And so we see that, we we see right here, verse 14, what comes right before, before verse 14 is these three angels' messages. So let's continue back down here to the idea of worship. The key right before Jesus comes is worship. This word appears eight times in chapters 13 and 14. And it's the central theme of the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, isn't it? When Jesus is out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, what is the devil trying to get him to do that whole time? He's trying to get him, and even straight out says it, if you just bow down and worship me just once, all of this will be yours. Before Jesus comes, the devil will be doing his very best to try to get people to worship him through whatever smokescreen he can, whatever nice-looking thing he can, to divert the true worship of God. That's what this angel is saying. That's what this message is saying, the clarity of who we should be worshiping. Revelation 4.11 says, "'You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power.'" You created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We know exactly who to be worshiping when we read the Bible. In Revelation 14, in this first angel's message, it references back to creation, to a creator God. And how can we not look at creation and a creator God without being reminded of how God finished creation with the seventh-day Sabbath? The call here by this first angel is a huge reminder to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy, which was the grand finale of creation week. When he says, remember who to worship, he doesn't say, remember to worship the God of the Israelites. He says, don't, he doesn't say anything about worshiping the God of the book of Acts, although it's the same. He throws a creation reminder in there which reminds us of just how important the Sabbath is. The Sabbath was the crown jewel of creation. It was the covenant between God and his creation to get together once a week as a reminder. That's why in the Ten Commandments it doesn't, doesn't say remember not to kill. It doesn't say remember not to covet. It says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath was important at creation. And here we see this reference back to creation, that the Sabbath still will be important right before Jesus comes. That is part of the message of the first angel. So what happens when this message of the gospel is shared to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? What is the impact when the first angel's message is followed? Lives are changed and people are brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Aaron and I lived in Bangkok, Thailand. You've probably heard several stories from Thailand. This is one of my favorites. We taught at an Adventist school just outside of Bangkok in a little town of Ramkamhang. I'll give you a dollar if you can spell that right. <laughs> Ramkamhang, Thailand. And 99% of our students were Buddhist. And part of our job was to, well, Aaron taught kindergarten. I taught uh, Bible and world history. And so one of my jobs was to teach these kids about the Bible. 
Now, Buddhism is a very, a very complex religion. It's part religion, part culture as well, which is why it's very hard to do evangelism in Buddhist countries. And we had a, we, we were studying through the Old Testament. And um, in, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, a lot of these countries, what we as Americans would say are tourist attractions, to them are items of worship. If you go around to some of the temples in, say, Thailand or Myanmar, any of these places, you will see Old Testament style golden images, 100, 120, 130 feet tall. And you will see people, as you go around, we, I would go and take pictures. The temples are beautiful. Again, they're more of a tourist attraction for Americans. But you would see these dear people, wonderful people, get down on their knees in front of these golden images. Almost like, almost like a, a page out of Daniel chapter 2. And you will see these people bow down to these golden images with their hands bowed like this, praying to this golden image. We don't see that here in the States. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. There's no way that happens anymore. A big chunk of the world still does this. And I'm reminded of the call of who we're supposed to worship. So we're going through these, these stories in the Old Testament. And we come to this one of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think it's Daniel chapter 2. I think it's Daniel chapter 4. Or I can't remember exactly what chapter it is. But the, the three Daniel's uh, friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there's the big golden statue, which is very familiar to these students of mine. And we're studying this story, and I can see the questions on these kids' minds. And this is about as real in the great controversy as you can get. Who to worship? And I've done for several months at this point talking about the God of heaven. And I'm trying my best to point these kids to Jesus. It's hard. It's really hard. So that was on a Friday that we went over this story. No point in worshiping stone. Stone can't do anything for you. Worship the God who made the stone. So that was on a Friday. On Monday, one of my students came back. This girl was sharp as a tack. She aced every class I taught her. Top of the class. Her, name, her, her English name was Kate because there's no way you and I could pronounce her real name because it's about this long. So she went by Kate. And Kate came up to me after Bible class on Monday. And she said this, and I'll never forget this as long as I live because it was one of those small victories for Jesus. She said, I went to, we had a big, a big religious thing with my family that we needed to go to, to the temple. And she said, there's a certain point where the, the monk is up there and, and at the certain, it was almost, it was almost just like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. She said, there's a certain time where everybody bows down at the same time to this big golden image. And she said, I remember, I remember what you said about the Bible and about God and about how we should only worship God and not worship stones or images or anything that's lifeless like that. That's not God. She said, I want you to know something. She said, I knew that point was coming. And I went to the back of the room. She said, when the time came for everybody to bow down to this Buddha, she said, I, I stayed in my seat. I didn't bow down to that golden image. She says, I think I'm going to be worshiping God from now on. And I'm not going to be bowing down to these golden images anymore. That was one of the highlights of my whole year there. And if it was just for that one kid, it was totally worth it. This is the message that people all around the world are thirsty for, and they just don't know it yet. All around the world right now, God is working to bring people to Him. Because more than anything, God wants to save you and everyone else that's made in his image on this planet. And so this first angel's message, take the gospel, the everlasting gospel, and preach it to those who dwell on earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, 
fear God, honor God, respect God, obey God. Give him glory. Live your life in a way that reflects his by putting other people first. The hour of his judgment has come and here's the reason you don't need to worry about that if you give your life to him and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and the spring of water. This is the message that we need to get out. And I believe God can use every single one of you in ministry somehow. Church at Franktown is not merely about coming here for an hour and a half each Sabbath morning and studying the Bible together. That's a fraction. That's a fraction. Being a follower of Jesus means implementing this first angel's message into your life on Sunday, on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and on Sabbath. This is a message and a commission to you and me to live for Jesus and to share that everlasting gospel with the people that we can. And like it says in Matthew 24, 14, as soon as as we have gotten the gospel all around the world, as soon as we have fulfilled this first angel's message, that's when Jesus is going to come. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to a day when there's no more sin, no more heartache, no more tears, no more sadness. But the Bible says in this same book, up in chapter 21, that God has wiped away all those tears. Those things don't ever happen again. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to seeing my Savior and hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. May you live each day looking forward to hearing those words as well and living your life in a way where you are preparing to meet your God and sharing that faith with the people around you. We're going to sing a closing song. It's a great song. It's called, When We All Get to Heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. As you sing this song, maybe in your mind be a little bit in heaven already. Be looking forward to the things that God has in store for you. Be looking forward to the people you're going to see in heaven. The beautiful reunions. Let's stand together and sing when we all get to heaven. Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful for the messages of these angels. Lord, we're thankful for the heads up, the warning of what to look for and who to worship and what to do until you come. Father, help us to always be students of the Bible. Help us always to be looking for the direction you want us to go. Thank you for being that light unto our path and the voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, be our guide through life and keep us faithful to you until you come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.